Hi everybody. It's well known that the whitewater in the Grand Canyon can be big, it can be powerful, and that the river can put you in places you'd rather not be. Rowing through those rapids is challenging even for the most experienced professionals. The challenge most of us face is we get down there only once every few years, and that makes for a tough learning curve. In this video, we're going to drill down into those rapids one by one. We'll analyze routes, we'll analyze strategies, and in the end, I hope it helps you be successful on your next Grand Canyon trip. Enjoy watching. Let's dive right in. Super smooth, dude. That was sweet. That was sweet. The first rapid we'll take a look at is Badger Creek Rapid. And before we dig into it, I just want to help you know what to expect from this video as we work through and analyze the rapids. Rowing in the Grand Canyon is challenging. Rowing the major rapids in the canyon is not for beginners or novices. Accordingly, my video is not a beginner's course in rowing technique. It is geared really for experienced rowers that understand the challenges and the risks and are simply looking to improve their understanding of the rapids in the Grand Canyon and the better techniques that might work there. I'll also say that there are a variety of techniques and routes that can work in any given rapid. Even the experienced professional guides have differing approaches. You should regard my recommendations in that context and make your own decisions informed by careful scouting and comparing strategies with other rowers on your trip. Now, in this video, we'll take interesting looks at rapids in the form of images from scouting locations, aerial images, and diagrams, all to understand the makeup and dynamics of the rapids. Much of what you'll be seeing are action videos of rowers making solid runs through the rapids, Friends have provided those for us, and this video project would not be possible without their contributions. Make sure and note the credits to those folks at the end. Especially in the first few rapids we look at, we'll drill into some subtle and some not-so-subtle techniques that rowers use to plan and execute their routes. I suppose you could think of these as advanced skills, but I don't like that term because the skills are all quite learnable. We'll be looking only at about a dozen of the more challenging rapids where routes are complex and the chances of flipping are higher. The insights you gain here should help you be ready for the rapids that we're not covering. There are several fine guidebooks available for river running in the canyon, and they can be found online and from some retailers in the Grand Canyon area. A good guidebook is critical for navigation. And trips I'm on usually have several among the rowers. I especially like this one by Tom Martin and Dwayne Whittis. It's comprehensive with info on routes through the rapids, camps, hikes, geology, history, and more. It's also handy to take other books along that focus on some of these same topics. I'll be using some specific terminology in this video describing how we move rafts with oars. We'll need to be ready to row with max efficiency, so let's cover some pointers here on the front end. As we work through rapids, I'll sometimes use the term pushing, or maybe I'll say pushing forward. And what I mean here is that we'll be moving the raft in the direction of the bow by pressing forward on the oars. I'll also say pulling at times, meaning we are moving the raft in the direction of the stern by reaching forward and pulling back on the oars. Owing to mechanical advantage that comes with the way our human bodies are configured, and because of the way we can brace ourselves into the rafts, we get significantly more force in our pulling strokes than we do from our pushing strokes. 
So when there's a big move to be made, we'll generally want to pull instead of push. You'll hear me use the term back ferry, and that is a traditional way we move the raft laterally across a rapid when we are facing downstream. In a back ferry, we set the angle of the stern toward the side we want to move to, and we pull more or less against the flow. Now, later in the video, you'll find me recommending strongly against the traditional back ferry in many places, owing to its relative ineffectiveness in the very fast water of the big rapids in the canyon. Now, the downstream ferry is a technique for lateral moves where we actually point the stern downstream at an angle toward the side we want to move to, and we pull. You'll see later how critical it is to use the downstream ferry as the preferred way to make lateral moves in many of the larger rapids. There's also the spin, where we pull on one oar and push on the other. We frequently use that to square up to meet waves and holes head on, or when we simply need to reverse directions quickly. And speaking of spinning, there's also the disco move. The disco move relies on the setup of your raft being accommodating, but the idea here is that if you suddenly realize that your bow is aimed in the direction that your stern should be, you simply stand up and stylishly spin your body 180 degrees to sit facing the opposite direction and then row from there. There's one final technique with the oars I want to cover here, and that is planting them to help you get through a wave. Some waves in the canyon are tall and steep and breaking at the crest, and a few have the power to stop and flip a raft. You'll hear me continue to emphasize that it is vital to meet these waves exactly head on, perpendicular to the angle of the wave crest. Sometimes it takes that quick spin I mentioned to establish that perfect angle on these waves. It also helps to take some hard forward pushing strokes as you approach a big breaking wave to gather just a little more speed to carry you through. And finally, as your raft climbs up the face, you reach up and plant the oar blades deep in one final forward push stroke and hold those oars in the water till you're up and over the top. Grabbing the downstream current through a wave like that prevents the raft from spinning at the wave top and it will help pull the raft forward just a little and it might make just the difference in avoiding a flip. Now, a little about using all these techniques efficiently. Before launching, make sure you have a solid raft set up. That means making sure the oars are well proportioned lengthwise on the rig so you can row for max power with them. Also, make sure that your sitting position puts you in the right place geometrically to work the oars with power, and especially that you have a good foot purchase in front of you so you can put your entire body into your pulling strokes. Shorter folks sometimes need to add foot spacers to the rowing frame for this, and rental outfitters for the canyon have them available with advance request. Now, you'll want to be as good as you can be at pulling and pushing and spinning. It's a great idea to practice and perfect your form by reaching, getting solid plants with the oars, and timing your recoveries. Remember that Grand Canyon rafts tend to be more heavily loaded than most of us are used to on other rivers. Newer rowers and smaller people should take on rafts that are not as heavily loaded as bigger, stronger, and more experienced rowers do. Also, smaller rafts are not necessarily easier to accelerate and move around for smaller people. The greater buoyancy and shallower draft of an 18-footer actually makes it easier to accelerate and spin than a proportionally loaded 16-footer. Plus, smaller rafts are generally more likely to flip than larger ones are. The canyon challenges us to be very much on our game starting the very first day of the trip, and being clear on these basic concepts will allow us to get straight into routes and to strategies as we discuss the specific rapids. As we explore them, you'll see that rapids behave differently at different flow rates, and our route planning can vary as a result. Let's discuss what to expect with water levels. Flow levels in the canyon are determined by discharges from Glen Canyon Dam by the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. And the Bureau provides those releases based on the amount of water available in the reservoirs upstream of the dam, demand for electricity that they generate with these discharges, and some complicated legal arrangements regarding downstream water needs. Here is a graph of flow rates at the USGS gauge located at Lee's Ferry for the calendar year 2020. 
For a number of years leading up to this, the Colorado River Basin has been suffering drought conditions, resulting in very low reservoir levels and correspondingly low discharges into the river compared to earlier decades. As a result, the terms low water and high water have sort of taken on new relative meanings. You can see that there is a seasonal pattern with higher discharges occurring in the hot summer months when power demand is high. Discharges at that time of year range from flows of about 9 to 11,000 CFS to highs of about 19,000. In the fall, when power demand is lowest, flows typically range from about 7,800 cubic feet per second to maybe 13,000. This chart might give you a sense of what kind of range to expect depending on the time of year of your trip. This could, of course, change if the drought in the basin is reversed at some point, and likewise, flows could go lower with the extension of drought conditions. Let's take a closer look at daily patterns with this chart of a midsummer week in 2020 again from the Lees Ferry Gauge, which is about 15 miles downstream of the dam. We see daily peak flows close to 17,000 and low flows of about 9,000 or so. Notice the two days corresponding to the weekend where discharges stayed at the low end owing to lower electricity demand. Now, it takes considerable time for these surges and ebbs in flow to make their way downstream. On each of the diagrams of the rapids I've prepared for you, you'll see that I have noted timing of typical peak and low flows for that particular location. There is also a tide table document that I'll include in the PDF file of rapid diagrams. It provides high and low flow info for lots of other locations and camps in the canyon. Not only is this info handy for anticipating water levels at the rapids, but it's really helpful to anticipate water level changes when beaching and tying up rafts at campsites. Based on these routine patterns the Bureau releases water on, there is generally pretty good predictability of flows. You can review the USGS gauge data and Bureau of Reclamation forecasts online to get a good sense of what to expect for your trip. The Park Service Ranger at the put-in will also have advice for you on this. There's always a possibility, though, that discharges can change suddenly and dramatically for reasons like dam repair issues or urgent electricity demands. Our discussion of tactics and routes through the rapids is generally going to correlate with current day normal range of water levels. What we will not be covering are situations in rapids that exist at unusual or extreme flow rates. For example, in March of 2021, the Bureau planned for five consecutive days of flow at 4,000 CFS around the clock. That's a low level that is rarely seen. Likewise, there are some years when, in October or November, the Bureau conducts high flow experiments where the discharge can be almost 40,000 CFS for three or four days straight. Know that many rapids change even more in character at those unusual flows, with some becoming more challenging and others less, depending on the level. In general, Lower flows add more challenge to many of the rapids, and I mention that because many of us are accustomed to whitewater being more forgiving at lower flows. Covering all the unusual flow situations is beyond what we can get into in this video, though. The best advice I can give you would be to scout frequently and go carefully in those extreme cases. There's a lot of info packed into this video. And that's why I've divided it into chapters so you can easily hop around or watch it in multiple sections. Finally, check at the end for a link that will allow you to download this entire video to your own devices, as well as for a link to the PDF file that contains all my diagrams of the rapids. Enough introduction, let's head to Badger Creek Rapid. Here's a great overhead view of Badger. The first thing I hope you'll notice is this clean, smooth route running through the rapid. If you start at the bottom and trace it upstream to the top, you can see that it's a clear tongue and is a fairly straight line all the way. Badger also has this really, really bad hole here, one of the very worst places a raft can find itself in the Grand Canyon. The problem in running Badger is that it's very, very hard to see the route and the hole because they are below the horizon line until you're actually entering the rapid. This Google Street View image is grabbed from just above the entrance. 
So the challenge in approaching the rapid is aligning on a good route. Let's track this rower in that effort. There are some really good things he's doing that I want to highlight. First, he is not pushing downstream and building speed. He's actually drifting slowly so he can read the rapid and the approach and have the time to adjust his route. He stands up to get his eyes a little higher relative to the horizon line. Notice too that he is dead sideways with his stern angled to the left. He knows that the trouble is to the right. He wants to be as ready as he can to pull away from that trouble. His read tells them that he might need to be a little further right, so he pushes, and then as he sees more, whoops, he realizes he's too far right. So he pulls with some energy now to correct, and he ends up barely missing the hole, but makes it through fine to the end. Here's an aerial image of the rapid, and what I want you to notice is this deep area leading into the entrance. It's angled toward the entrance from the left, and it channels the drainage from the big pool above on a left to right path. When you are approaching Badger, if you pay close attention, you'll see that flow. We call this effect, perhaps inaccurately, sheet flow, and we say that the water is sheeting from left to right here. Think back to our rower finding himself further right than he expected. That could well be attributed to the sheet flow. Because subtle flows of current like this in the Grand Canyon can be powerful and they can affect your route, you really should be attentive to them as you scout and as you read water. You might be asking yourself whether or not you should scout Badger Creek Rapid. My answer is maybe. If there are rowers in your trip that will be challenged by rowing in the Grand Canyon, then I recommend you scout. We'll cover scouting skills and technique a little later, but it can really help rowers to be able to scout a rapid, learn from what they are seeing, develop strategies for themselves, and then confidently row their own route. Plus, it'll keep everyone out of that bad hole. Here is a diagram of Badger Creek Rapid. I'll be including similar ones for all the rapids we discuss. The blue arrows will show very specific directions of current flow in different places within a rapid. There will be indicators of hazards and other things to watch out for. There will be indicators for scouting locations. And I'll always use this little raft icon to indicate routing through the rapids as well as fairly precise positioning and orientation of the raft. As I mentioned earlier, you can check at the very end of this video for a special link so that you may download the diagrams in a single PDF file. The diagrams will also include an information box with a few notes. I know that those notes will be hard for you to read on your screen, so I'll show them in an expanded format at the end of each chapter just like this. And go ahead and pause the video anytime you want to absorb or ponder the diagrams or the takeaway points. Onward to House Rock Rapid. This one is big and challenging with strong flip potential, and it also requires making an aggressive lateral move. So we'll spend a little extra time here on strategy and technique. This aerial view gives a sense of the layout of the rapid. When you scout it, you'll see that you'll need to exit on the river right at the bottom because there are a couple of stout holes here and here that claim more than their share of flips. Because of the sharp bend, the river tends to take you to the outside or to the left toward those bad holes. So our challenge is going to be working to the inside to avoid them. A closer look during my scouting helps me see that below the shallow area formed by a big cobble bar, the river widens out a bit and the current slows over here on the right. And I see the key to success will be somehow tucking into that area. I have identified the crux of the rapid. In order to make that move through the crux, I'm going to strongly recommend that you use what we call a downstream ferry. Because not everyone is familiar with that technique, I'm going to take a few minutes to look at it with you. As you can see, it involves going stern first, downstream, angle in the direction of the lateral move you intend. The idea here is to maximize lateral momentum across the rapid before gravity and the speed of the current accelerate you along the tongue and take you toward the outside of that bend. I'm going to get a little technical the next couple of minutes explaining some dynamics. Please hang with me. Here is a very cool USGS published set of maps of House Rock Rapid. They illustrate a lot of data, and I'm going to use the map that shows current velocities at various places. 
The steps for a good downstream ferry go like this. I want to start in the calm water of the pool, above where it begins to accelerate, and before gravity starts pulling my raft downstream. Right here, at my starting point, the water is probably moving slowly at maybe 1.5 meters per second, or a little over 3 miles an hour. I have carefully planned my start, and I begin accelerating from there across the calmer, slower water of the pool as I reach the entrance. A loaded 18-foot raft in the Grand Canyon can weigh between 1,500 and 2,000 pounds. So it's going to take me several pulls and a little bit of time to accelerate and build the momentum I need. Because the water is relatively slow in the pool, and because the pool is wide, I have the time and space to do that. Entering the rapid, gravity and the drag of the current are going to tend to pull me toward the outside of the bend. The current here is now up to about 12 miles per hour, and the good news is that my heavy raft is already tracking strongly with lots of momentum to the inside. Another big factor is that at the edge of the tongue are these diagonal waves. It's really important that I meet them head on, in this case, with the long axis of my raft being at a right angle to the crest of those waves. This is important because my raft tracks best along its axis, the way a canoe does, and my angle and the narrowness of the stern helps me punch and track through those waves. Again, it's the crux of the rapid right here, so I'm eager to get across and into the slower current well right of the holes. I'm going to zoom in a little closer here to talk about a big challenge that comes up with the downstream ferry. It involves what we call current differentials. If we look carefully at specific current velocities, we see that here in the main current, the flow is measured at 5.4 meters a second. And here, not far away at all, near the edge of the channel, it's flowing just half that speed, or 2.7 meters per second. It's this kind of contrasting velocity rates that we are referring to when we use the term current differential. Now, when we are making a downstream ferry, we nearly always are driving our raft stern first from fast current to slower current across continuous current differential. And it's important to understand and to anticipate the forces that are going to act on our raft when we do that. As we cross a differential, my stern is continually finding itself in slower flow than my bow is. That faster flow out here has the tendency to drag my bow downstream relative to the stern. And that spinning effect can be quite powerful when the current differential is high between bow and stern. When that spin happens against our will, we call it losing our ferry angle. And when we lose our ferry angle, we are not making progress on our route any longer. In this case, that might mean staying out in the flow of the main tongue and not moving to the right into that slower water and avoiding the holes. As you watch downstream ferries in this video and as you browse other videos online, see if you can tell when rowers might be losing their ferry angles. Now, in our scouting, and as we read water on the fly while we are running a rapid like this, we need to see and anticipate current differentials like this so we can do something about it with our rowing. One tactic we can use to adjust is how we apply different amounts of power on the different oars. If I anticipate or feel that a current differential is tending to spin my bow to the right, as would be the case here, I can, for the moment, put more rowing power on the left or upstream oar and also lighten the force on the downstream oar. Pulling harder on that upstream oar, of course, has the effect of spinning my stern to the right and my bow to the left, which is opposite the forces that the current differentials are applying to the raft. That can be okay as a corrective measure, but I'd rather be applying my rowing force with both oars to drive me along my desired route if I possibly can. And it turns out there is a way to do that. If I sharpen my downstream angle, or as I usually say, make it a more aggressive downstream angle like this, I can be more successful. Consider this, if my raft is on this angle, the difference in current velocities between bow and stern is smaller, and with the long axis of my raft more closely aligned with current directions instead of crossing them, 
I'll be using less rowing power to correct my angle and more of it to drive me along my route. In contrast, at this angle, the current differential between bow and stern is the greatest, so the spinning forces on my raft are also the greatest, and I'll be using more of my rowing effort to maintain my angle or correct it, and less of it to drive my raft along the desired route. Later in the video, the analysis of bedrock rapid is our best example of how all this tends to work out. Now, I know this discussion of current differentials might be a little confusing to you, so here in a couple minutes, I'm going to say a little more about this, along with a way you can practice the downstream ferry and get a feel for what I'm describing. But to sum it up, key takeaways here are, one, in your scouting and as you read water on the fly, look carefully for current differentials and anticipate the spinning forces that they might impart on your raft. Two, be ready to adjust rowing power especially on the upstream or to offset. And three, perhaps most importantly, be ready to use more aggressive downstream ferry angles where current differentials are the greatest. One thing that can go wrong is that you can drive your ferry too early and too hard, especially at lower flows, and end up hitting that cobble bar too high. And that can make for a rebound effect that sends you back out into the tongue and toward the holes. It does not hurt much to start a little early as long as you are able to pause your drive if you see that you're coming across too hot and too high. As we watch downstream ferries underway here, what I hope you'll see is that the primary challenge comes with positioning, timing, managing route, and angle. Notice especially how the rowers are frequently adjusting their accelerations. The downstream ferry is more about timing and finesse than it is about power. We'll talk more about plan B or fallback contingencies a little later, but let me just say for the moment that if you are further left than you want out in the tongue, make sure that you tee up and hit any breaking waves, especially those holes, head on in perpendicular fashion to reduce the chances of flipping. Rafts do occasionally make it through those holes when they hit them head on. Now, even though I recommend strongly against it here, it's worth considering what happens when using the back ferry at House Rock. On a traditional back ferry, I might tend to line up out to the left again in the pool. Because strong rowing can move the raft at 4 or 5 miles per hour, I really can't start rowing until I am out of the slow water and starting into the entrance. And as I begin rowing harder, the current underneath me is accelerating very quickly up to about 12 miles per hour. So I've had very little time to build momentum of any kind, especially in that lateral direction from left to right. And finally, if and when I reach those diagonal waves on the right edge, my raft will be broadside to them, unlikely to get up and over them, and they will tend to deflect me back downstream along the tongue and toward the holes. Now, I'm not saying that it's impossible to use a back ferry successfully at House Rock. People do that sometimes, but the back ferry requires a lot more strength, a lot more power, and a lot more precision than the downstream ferry does, and the chances of ending up too far left and flipping are too great. As you browse online videos of folks rowing House Rock, see what you think for yourself. So, if you've never done a downstream ferry, you may be wondering how in the heck you're supposed to arrive at House Rock and get the positioning and the timing right to do your first downstream ferry here. Well, the way to avoid that is to practice some downstream ferries in the smaller rapids and riffles earlier in the trip. There are no penalties associated with your learning curve up there. Here is a diagram of a typical Grand Canyon riffle. There is a nice elongated downstream V, there's a small pour over midway on the right side, and a nice crisp eddy at the lower left. An exercise could be to start on the left above the entrance, build speed, maintain angle, and drive your stern into the slower water or eddy below the pour over, allowing it to spin the raft naturally. The real benefit will come with doing an exercise like this with precision, being very thoughtful about starting position, about speed, angle, and especially where you want to cross below that pour over. Another exercise here could be to start at the top right and drive a downstream ferry so that you enter the eddy at the bottom left, again, in a very precise way. The first few efforts might feel a little awkward or even intimidating because turning your head that far around for downstream vision while continuing to row with power might well be a new thing to you. And precisely managing angles while rowing backwards with the current can be unfamiliar as well. 
Your first few tries might be discouraging, but the learning curve is really short. In any event, continue to practice downstream ferries at full rowing effort and with tight precision until you are confident and you're comfortable with them. We are going to zoom in here for a minute to revisit the topic of current differentials. Here at the end of this riffle, if I look carefully, I might see that out here in the center of the flow, the riverbed is its deepest and the current velocity is greatest. As I look further left toward the eddy line, I can see that it is shallower and the downstream current is a bit slower, so we have a current differential going on here. And of course, when we get to the eddy line, we have the most abrupt current differential of all, with the water in the eddy either being calm or perhaps moving upstream a bit. Now, in my practice in this situation, I'll want to pay attention to how all these differentials might influence my raft, and I can anticipate that they'll tend to have that spinning effect we discussed earlier. So, what I encourage you to do as you practice is to find welcoming eddies like this at the lower end of riffles and to make downstream ferries across the differentials using differing approaches in angle and in rowing tactics to see how they work out. For example, in one exercise, you might use a very modest ferry angle like this. Further downstream on another riffle, you might use a much more aggressive ferry angle more like this. Vary your rowing power on each oar as you anticipate the feel of the current differentials acting on your raft. And when it comes to entering the eddy, play with how different angles of your approach and different speeds of your raft play out. I think you'll find that a more aggressive downstream ferry angle allows you to penetrate deeper into an eddy, carving an arc, something like this, while a shallower angle, like this, will tend to snap your raft around in a spin closer to the eddy line. It's also helpful to realize that when you are in an eddy and want to row back out into the current, you are once again challenged with how to manage rowing across current differentials. Again, a sharper angle, this time upstream, might allow you to penetrate deeper out into the flow, while a shallower angle like this will tend to spin you quicker and keep you closer to the eddy line. Key in doing these exercises is to look carefully and to see these current differentials in advance, to anticipate the effects they'll have on your raft, and to manage angles and rowing tactics so that you are rowing on your own pre-planned routes and not allowing the river to unexpectedly mess with your plan. There really are no right ways nor wrong ways to cross current differentials. The river does challenge us though to do it differently in different situations. A key situation where having done these exercises will really help you out is in the swirlies in the exits of the rapids. Those places where weird whirlpools and mysterious jets of current tend to spin you and take you offline. After all, those swirlies are just a bunch of chaotic complex current differentials and it's all about seeing them coming and staying ahead of the curve and routing through them. A couple years ago, I listened to a wise whitewater expert describing what he thought was the most important skill to develop when it comes to running the most difficult whitewater. He said that in his mind, it's all about seeing the subtle current differentials in complex patches of whitewater and becoming really good at confidently running desired routes across them. I agree with him and I hope these exercises can help you and accelerate you with your own skills. So that's our deep dive into downstream ferry technique and how it works at House Rock. There are a few more places downstream where you'll need that technique again, so be ready. Before moving downstream, I want to cover a couple more points about House Rock. The first is that House Rock becomes more difficult the lower the flow, especially below about 10,000 CFS. The reason is that the channel on the left becomes narrower and there is just less room to make your move. The higher the flow, the easier it is to move right as that debris fan, the cobble bar, becomes more covered with water. It turns out that higher flows from the dam reach House Rock starting about midday, so many groups make sure and launch as early as possible from Lee's Ferry so they can run House Rock late that same afternoon camping below. Secondly, House Rock is a must-scout rapid. You can scout from either the left or the right, and it might be that scouting from the left will help you visualize your route and plan that downstream ferry the best. 
There is a whole set of skills and steps that go into effective scouting of a rapid. We'll cover those once we get down to Hans Rapid. But for now, know that really good scouting at House Rock is important so that you can nail the run. Downstream we go. We've arrived at 24 Mile Rapid, otherwise known as Georgie Rapid, named to honor the memory of Georgie White. She was one of history's most colorful and memorable Grand Canyon River runners. This rapid is fairly simple. It involves a single drop, but a couple things about it tend to catch folks off guard. First, there's a hole in the drop that's complex and can flip a raft, and then there is this pin rock near the main flow in the run out of the rapid. It's pretty clear that I need to be left of that pin rock as I exit, so I need to figure out how to get through the drop and do that. Let's break it down. Here is a look at the hole from the bow of a raft. The area on the right is the deepest and stiffest part of the hole. We call it the pit, and it's worth avoiding if we can. The left side of the hole is actually diagonal, with its angle being about 45 degrees to the direction of the current. Now, big diagonal waves in the canyon are notorious for flipping rafts, and the way it tends to happen is that a raft that is oriented straight downstream tends to get stopped and spun enough so that it flips sideways. The way to avoid flipping like that, and this is one of the cardinal rules of rowing in the canyon, is to make sure that you tee up and hit a wave perpendicular to the angle of the wave itself, regardless of the direction of the current. It's also really helpful to develop some momentum to pierce or run straight through the wave on that same perpendicular angle. So in this case, I'll start up here in the pool, get a good position a little to the right, and push forward with the oars on a path that is right to left so that I'm able to pierce through that diagonal wave head on. Now, since the pin rock is on the right side of the downstream runout, a bonus is that the right to left push helps me exit the drop with better position and better momentum. But after the drop, make sure you immediately judge the direction of your raft so that you can work early to move away from the pin rock if you need to. Sorry I don't have good footage of a rower, but here's some solid footage of an open canoe running the drop that will help you see how it all fits together, including a good close-up of the pin rock. Not a lot of changes for this rapid based on water level, except that in flows above about 15,000, the hole gets a little less grabby and things tend to get easier. As for scouting, my advice is similar to that of Badger, in that it would be a great opportunity to help evolving rowers analyze the situation, make a plan, and have a great run to develop confidence. Plus, it reduces the chances for flips or pins. Onward! We've arrived here at Hans. It's a complex rapid, and this photo gives us a great look from the scouting position. The flow in this scene is maybe 11,000 CFS. Before we get into the details of row enhance, this photo is a good prompt to talk a little about an important safety consideration. Here at Hans, we enter the Granite Gorge, and that means longer and more continuous rapids. It also increases the potential for long swims in cold water when flips happen or when swimmers get separated from rafts. Drownings do occur sometimes as a result. To guard against these risks, the best thing we can do within a trip is always have others in position to rescue. And the best way to do that is to always run tightly in groups, space maybe 20 seconds apart. Consider having strong rowers in both the lead and the sweep rafts, making sure that the sweep carries the major first aid kit. The lead rafts and any kayaker should always pause in the eddies below significant rapids, ready for rescue. Rowers should always monitor the raft immediately downstream and the one immediately upstream for trouble. And if there is a flip or a swimmer, a rescuing raft should generally make sure it is on track for a successful run in order to make a good rescue. These practices are important in all the significant rapids in the Grand Canyon, not just the longer ones. It's best to talk through the full range of safety protocols like this before launching at Lee's Ferry to make sure everyone on the trip is focused and that a culture of safety awareness is prevalent throughout the trip. There's an important set of skills and steps involved in scouting that can make all the difference in having a good run. So we're going to use this rapid and take some time to walk through those together. First, we'll look downstream to see where we'll want to finish. 
I can see that the lower part of the rapid, we call it Son of Hans, is wide open with no hazards. So my eyes take me up here to the main part. It's more apparent when scouting in person, but I can see that this area to the right has a number of bad holes and pour overs, so there are no reasonable routes through there. This large area is lovingly referred to as the land of the giants. To avoid that area, I see that there is a fairly clear path along here, left of center. Coming further upstream, I see that there is no reasonable entrance on the left, and that I'll be forced to enter in one of these channels over here on the right. I look carefully as to the direction and the speed of the current and I notice that those channels are fairly swift and they actually are directed on a bit of a rightward angle. I'm putting together in my mind now that I'll need a pretty aggressive right to left move to avoid being sent down to contend with those giants. I see that there is this area of eddies and slower water the biggest part of all that is this large eddy here. We call it the duck pond. And I know that the more I can use the duck pond, the better off I'll be moving to the left. Now, I also clearly see that there is a strong and narrow band of current differential between this jet and the duck pond. And I can already tell I'll need to carefully manage my raft's angle as I cross through that. I clearly see now that this is the crux of the rapid, and it all sets up very nicely for a downstream ferry. This channel here seems to be the place to enter because it has a bit of width, and entering here puts me within reach of the slower water in the duck pond that I want to use. Remember that getting momentum in the flat water above the entry can really help with a downstream ferry. So in my mind's eye, I picture where I want to start, right about here, the kind of speed I'll need, my angle, and exactly where I want to be as I enter and move through. A picture like this emerges. I can see my entire route in my mind, and I have confidence it can work. Now comes the most important step, identifying the landmarks I'll use once I'm rowing. I do this because everything looks really different from water level and it's super easy to lose your bearings once in the river. I'm going to pick just three landmarks as more than that might be too many to keep track of and I know that if I make it through the crux of the rapid I'll be able to find my way from there. The first landmark is this initial smooth glassy wave above the entrance. I am certain that I'll be able to see it from the pool above, and at that point the details further downstream in the rapid will still be out of view because of the horizon line. I want to position and approach, so I'll be looking over my left shoulder at that little wave, and I'll pass just above it, still accelerating on my downstream ferry. Once I pass that, I'll focus on my next guidepost. It's going to be that biggest rock that creates the duck pond. The reason I picked the largest rock is that it will be standing up tall above any horizon line, and I'm certain I can pick it up visually. Now, I am not aiming for the rock. I am actually aiming for a point maybe 25 feet downstream of that rock because I know that's where the duck pond is. So now I'll be monitoring the position of that rock as I row hard and maintain angle. If I planned and I execute well, I can reach the duck pond on target and I'm on a good path. Earlier in my scouting, I noted the very strong current differential involved in the transition from the jet to the calm water of the duck pond. As I drive my raft stern first across that differential, I'm first of all making sure to use a fairly sharp downstream angle, but I know I'll need to monitor and perhaps use my rowing, maybe with extra effort on that upstream oar, to counteract the spinning effect that will likely come with that move. My final guidepost will be this set of two small pour overs that define the lower end of the duck pond. Ideally, I want to see them to the left of my raft as I move across the pond, but it might be that I've slipped lower than I want, and if so, I'll maintain my angle, and I'll keep pulling, and I'll splash through them as I continue on my downstream ferry, knowing that I've still got a little work to do to get left of the land of giants. Once I've gotten through this crux and am sufficiently far left, it's pretty straightforward. Now, if I've been unsuccessful achieving my route and I am too low, I'll be seeing those two pour-overs and the duck pond on the upstream or right side of my raft. In my scouting, I have planned for this potential set of circumstances and I've considered it as a plan B. And the strategy I've settled on is that I would continue to work my downstream ferry just a little longer, but not much longer, before I spin and face downstream. 
I know the last thing I want to do is find myself sideways as I reach one of the big holes or pour overs in the land of the Giants. You just always, always want to tee up and hit bigger holes and breaking waves head on no matter what. Having looked at those holes in that area during the scout, I've acknowledged that a flip might be possible, but I also think there's a good chance I can punch through those if I establish good angle. So in that scenario, I've abandoned plan A and I'm thoroughly committed to plan B and making the best of it. Now, one thing you might consider in your scout would be a traditional back ferry move at Hans. Now, just like at House Rock, I do not recommend the traditional back ferry because it increases the chances of a flip, but let's analyze how someone might think through it as they scout. Now, it might appear that if I enter here with minimal downstream speed and begin my back ferry with proper angle, and if I row really hard, I might just slide sideways toward the duck pond and move on across something like this. Let's watch a really strong rower use the back ferry to try just that, and we'll see how challenging this really is. There are some things to note here in this run. The first is that her lateral movement from right to left is very modest compared to a downstream ferry. Another is that the jet she is using is angled rightward, as we saw earlier, and that the current there overwhelms her rowing power and takes her in the direction of that tongue. Also, watch the effect of this small diagonal wave in the entrance and how the raft contacts it broadside and the raft gets redirected along the line of the tongue, causing her to lose her ferry angle and move a little further right, actually. These are the same negative factors we discussed at House Rock. Now, our rower is strong and experienced and she kind of scrambles here, rowing really hard with an aggressive angle, hits one of the giants and barely misses this other one, but makes it through to the end. Probably a closer call than she would have liked, but she succeeded. From the scout view, the route ended up being something like this, and that is a bit different from what we sketched out a minute ago as a goal for the back ferry route. I hope you see now that relying on the back ferry here is a lot less dependable than a downstream ferry, and it requires a lot more rowing power to boot. The final point I want to make about scouting and routing is that I recommend strongly against putting your faith in following another raft. First of all, as that raft enters the rapid ahead of you, it will tend to race off downstream while you are still in your approach, and it can be nearly impossible to visually track them with accuracy. And every second you spend visually tracking another raft takes away from your own awareness as to where you are in executing your own route. There is also a good chance that the other rower has either chosen a different route than yours or has missed the route they intended. I've actually seen rafts flip when rowers get into bad places because they got lost trying to follow instead of building and relying on their own strategies. Regarding water levels and Hans Rapid, the Land of the Giants does present some possible routes at, say, levels higher than about 15,000, and some folks choose to look for routes through there. Yes, those routes might emerge, but the holes that remain tend to get bigger and stiffer, and landmarks through the Land of Giants are hard to identify. I generally would not recommend routing through the Land of Giants at any level. As we leave Hans, let's enjoy a really good complete run from top to bottom. See you downstream.
Horn Creek is a must scout rapid and you'll want to do that from the right side. It can have two route options, a left run and a right to left run depending on water level. Let's first take the right to left approach which is good at all levels and is the preferred option for levels below maybe 10,000 CFS. In my scouting and starting at the bottom as usual, the first thing I notice is that in the run out on the left, there is a corner of the wall that looks like it could result in a pin or a flip. I also see this protruding rock from the right shore that seems even more harsh. They are both duly noted. I see that I'll need to exit the rapid left of center thanks to some stout holes on the right side. Those holes do sometimes cause flips. As I move upstream, I see that the entrance is on the right side, so again, a lateral move will be in order to get me to the left. The rock that separates the right entrance from the left side is called the right horn. It creates a strong pour over, except at very low levels when the rock begins to show its mossy head. In any case, the big thing about the right horn is that a series of large reactionary diagonal waves leads from it along here. In making my right to left move, I'll need to get up, over, and left of those diagonal waves. I also see that the water just below the right horn, while not exactly an eddy, is very slow, and so there's a very sharp current differential there just past the diagonal. I'll need to anticipate the spinning effect it would have on my raft. I'll of course need to manage raft angle and rowing in the process. I see now that crossing the diagonal wave and the current differential is going to be the crux of this route. And you guessed it, a downstream ferry is just the ticket here. As a matter of fact, it is nearly impossible to make that right to left move any other way. Let's walk through the familiar steps using the diagram. I'll start in the upstream pool on the right, carefully gauging angle, path, and necessary pace. In the slow water of the pool, I've developed lateral momentum. In my scout, I've chosen only one landmark, and that is the right horn because I know I'll see it from above, and I know that the crux is just below it. Now, driving through the diagonal with a perpendicular angle to the wave crest immediately below the right horn is going to be really important because, for one thing, the diagonals are taller further downstream, and secondly, my raft would be more affected by gravity and the quickly accelerating downstream flow if I go any lower at all. My aim is to cross so closely below the right horn that my upstream oar literally passes over the top of it. Remember, if I start early and I find myself hot and high, I can pause my acceleration. But if I start late or I'm too low, it's impossible to make up for that. As we watch a couple of rowers make this right to left move, they're doing a great job of timing and routing and they drive just below that right horn and they both have successful runs missing the holes on the lower right. When I run that route, I generally try to maintain my stern downstream angle and get even more crossing penetration below the right horn before letting my bow swing downstream. I just like the idea of getting further left and further away from those holes. At levels somewhere in the range of 8 to 12,000, an entrance on the left side becomes available. It is here between the right and left horns. Entering here puts me in good shape to find my way down the left side. In this case, my two landmarks are the right and left horns, fairly easy to see from above. And I'm going to just push bow first right between them. While it's an easy route to follow, there can be a bit of a jolt in the initial drop as we see here. It can help to have a slightly bow left angle here to avoid being spit out of this drop to the right. At levels in the lower ranges of maybe 8 to 10,000 or so, the rocky hole at the base of the drop can provide a significant jolt, so many rowers avoid this route at those levels. Because the right to left run is fairly predictable and achievable with downstream ferry even at higher flows, some rowers will continue to use it at those levels as well. As always, if you find yourself off route, Hit any and all breaking waves head on and make sure and plant your oars into the peaks of the waves to help carry you through.
I want to start our discussion of Granite Rapid with a look at the USGS survey map for a couple reasons. One is it gives us a sense for how the main flow of the rapid hugs the sheer rock wall. The other is that this current velocities map made at 7,000 CFS shows us how granite features some of the very fastest water in the entire Grand Canyon. There are a couple readings of 7.3 meters per second, which translates to about 16 miles an hour. And it's even faster than that at high flows. It's just a thrill to whiz along the wall going fast like that. Let's talk about how to row granite. Our scouting is from the left side requiring a walk downstream to get our best look. As we look at the bottom end of the rapid, the first thing we note is a large eddy on the right, and in the scout I see that it has a sharp eddy line that is right next to the main downstream current. The eddy itself has strong upstream flow. Eddies like this are not good places for rafts to go as it can be very challenging to escape past the eddy line or the eddy fence and get back out into the main flow. So I know I'll want to guard against being too far right when I get to that point. Complicating things as my eyes move a little upstream is the stiff breaking wave or hole just to the left of the main flow. That wave does have the power to flip a raft. It's even stiffer, by the way, at lower flows. I see that I'll need a line that has me avoiding both the hole and the eddy, and the good news is that this would have me right down the center of the main flow. As I look further upstream, I see that there seems to be a series of peaking waves that don't break much, all in the center of the flow up to the entrance in the pool above. I see that the path of the flow is making a modest right to left bend, but not nearly as much as, say, house rock. So I know I'll need to guard a little from moving to the outside and contending with the wall itself. I also see a series of big downstream angle diagonal waves to the right of the main flow. I'll want to make sure and not get broadside on any of those as they look to have the power to flip a raft as well. The good news from scouting is that there seems to be a good clean route from the top to the bottom, right in the center of the flow over the peaks of those waves. A good friend of mine says he thinks of this as taking the high line, meaning over the high peaks of the waves all the way through. I've decided that entering on a good line is really the crux of this rapid. As I look carefully at the entrance, I'm seeing that there really are not good distinctive landmarks out on the river to help guide me on an exact line. Rather, I'll need to approximate my position based on distance off the right shore. So let's follow this rower as she enters and runs through. She's doing it all very well. She's approaching slowly to buy time for reading and adjusting her route. She even stands on her tiptoes to get the best possible view. She sees that she is perhaps a little right of the ideal line, so she pushes forward to the left a bit. And I suspect she's also thinking at this point that leftward momentum is going to help her avoid any tendency to move to the outside of the bend. As you can see, our rower has found that center line stays on it and passes easily to the right of the braking wave and stays clear of the eddy at the lower right. In terms of plan B contingencies, I'll suggest a couple things, and we have covered these before. First, if I find myself too far right, and heading into the diagonals or toward the wall, it is just crucial that I maintain a bow first angle and contact those diagonals perpendicular or head on. The mistake would be to turn my bow to the left and try to push away from the wall because that would put me broadside to those large diagonals and that is a common way that flips happen at granite. The second is that if I find myself further left than I want, it will be vital that I am ready to tee up and meet that breaking wave at the bottom head on. Here's a look at my diagram for the rapid. The strategy stays generally the same at all water levels at granite, though at higher flows, some rowers choose to enter a little further left, finding their way to the high line before getting to the breaking wave at the bottom left. Here we are at Hermit, legendary for its train of about 10 consecutive very tall waves. Hermit is an experience, so let's enjoy the experience before we analyze it.
let's scout this rapid from the left. At lower flows up to about 13,000, I'll see that the left side of about the eighth wave surges and breaks enough that it might give me problems. In that situation, I decide I'll be fine if I'm in the center or slightly right at that point. At medium flows up to about 20,000, it seems that there is a wave that is about the ninth in the series that is breaking right of center and worth avoiding. For that, I'd want to be center or maybe even slightly left. And it flows in the 20,000 to 25,000 range. A wave that is maybe the sixth one in the series is breaking pretty harshly in the center extending leftward. And in that scenario, I'll prefer to skirt it on the right. Above about 25,000 CFS, it all washes out, still with very tall waves, but none breaking too harshly. When you scout the rapid, just make sure you know where any troublesome breaking waves are and you can plan your route accordingly. It's generally going to be down the middle, though. I also note that the very first wave in the series is a bit of a diagonal angling downstream from left to right, and I see that it has the potential to surf my raft a little bit in that direction to the right, so maybe I'll have a slightly left of center approach with a little left angle to tee up to that diagonal, and I'll just let it surf me to the center. I've decided that the crux of this rapid will be to align properly as I enter. And as I consider landmarks for the entrance, I see that Hermit features a very gradual sloping entrance with a pronounced downstream V, and I know I'll be able to align based on my position relative to that V. In other words, it's going to be easy to see as I approach. Let's watch this run where our rower anticipates the tendency of the first diagonal to surf him to the right, so he approaches a little left of center and allows the wave to move him perfectly into the center. In this next run, you'll see how the wave redirects this rower a bit to the right, but he recovers well and he's back on track. Here's the diagram of Hermit. And by the way, Hermit offers the opportunity for great photographs and video from shore. It's a simple thing for a passenger to stay on shore, shoot the photography, and then walk down to rejoin the rafts in the generous eddy below on the left. Crystal Rapid was a modest riffle until December 1966, when about 14 inches of rain fell along the north rim, and that caused an immense flash flood of Crystal Creek, estimated to have a peak flow of 10,000 CFS. The resulting debris fan created the rapid we know today. The length and complexity of Crystal, along with potential consequences for being offline, will have us spending a little extra time analyzing it, so let's dive in. This great photo from up on the tapetes layer allows us to see the entire rapid in context. Scouting this rapid is on the right side. While many simply scout from river level, I encourage you to walk up on the overlooking bench here to get a good perspective in your scouting. Crystal is almost a half mile in overall length, and the lower part is worth considering carefully. As you see from this photo, there are two channels, a far left one and a right one. Both are available at all water levels, but the left side one is narrow and brings with it some flip potential in a couple of spots along the left wall. The right side is the better of the two choices. The main thing to be aware of is that the rock-strewn and shallow upstream end of the center island here is a really bad place for rafts to end up. In some cases of stranded in pin rafts here, helicopter recovery has been the only feasible option. That's right, helicopters have been called in to help free rafts and people caught there. So the message here is that as you exit the upper part of the rapid, be very clear but also flexible about your routing and act early to get established on either the left route or the right route. The upper part of the rapid is where most of the routing and rowing challenge is. As I consider routes upward through the rapid, I can see that there is a potential route on the right and a potential route on the left, depending on water level. Let's look first at the right side route, which is reliable at all water levels. I see there are two hazards along this route to consider. A lower braking wave that we call the new wave, since it was formed in the 1983 floods, 
it washes out at higher flows. Then there is the main hole that has a deep pit, is very stiff at all levels, and is likely to flip any raft that finds itself in there. I see that if I can make it far enough right, I should be able to skirt the holes on that side. Now, it would appear that using a downstream ferry approach where I start a bit toward the center of the pool above and simply drive left to right through the entrance would be just the ticket. But there are a couple of nuances of this particular situation that make this approach difficult and risky. It took me a few trips to learn this from more experienced friends. First, the water in the pool, especially out toward the center, is actually accelerating downstream fairly quickly before it even reaches the entrance. Second, there is a significant right-to-left sheet flow close to the entrance about here. These factors tend to foul up timing and necessary acceleration of the downstream cut, and rowers trying the downstream ferry tend to find themselves too far out toward the center and flirting with the main hole as we see in this clip. Our rower here is strong with very intentional approach, and she did not start very far out in the pool the way some might. As you've seen, after some really hard rowing, it was a little too close for comfort with the main hole there. The good news is that there's a different strategy that is very reliable, sort of a start right and stay right approach. If I look closely, the cobble bar that defines the right shoreline is carved in a way that allows the riverbed to be fairly deep along that edge, and the current moves straight downstream along there as well. So, if I align on the right side of the pool above, I can drift past this one small pour over in the entrance here, tuck in below it, and use some downstream ferry rowing to help keep me along the right shoreline as I move past the main hole in the new wave. In doing so, I'm careful to avoid actually hitting the shoreline rocks and rebounding out into the main flow. A friend who is a professional boatman with many dozens of trips in the canyon tells me that he finds this approach highly reliable at all water levels. The crux in this routing is, of course, getting near the shoreline early, and the simple landmark is that rock pour-over near the top that you can tuck in just below. Finally, making it nicely down this right side route sets me up perfectly to be well right of the problematic rock island in the lower part of the rapid. Many people prefer to use the left side run at levels up to about 12,000, above which it gets a little too rowdy over there with holes that are hard to miss. As we look at the lower end of the left side, I want to make sure you see this boulder sticking out from the wall and how the outflow from the rapid aims pretty much straight for it. That boulder is a bit undercut, and rafts are known to pin and to flip here. Since it's a good distance below the crux of this left side run, make sure and anticipate it, and be ready to move away from it. Moving upstream, I see there is a stiff diagonal hole extending from the left shore, and you must avoid that. We call it the Slate Creek Ledge, named for the creek that flows in from the left there. Upstream of that is a breaking wave or two out toward the center, and then a couple more diagonal ledges that extend off the left shore in the entrance. Again, at modest flows, there is a route through all this. As I examine the pool above, there are no easy landmarks that will help me nail down my position, and the entrance drops away quickly, so I'll need to estimate my position relative to the left shore. I'll approach slowly, and I'll be ready to adjust. Now, I have rowed both sides of Upper Crystal, and I've come to favor that right side run, which is available at all levels. A big reason is that the left side routing is complex, there are a number of hazards that can cause me to lose an oar or have a swimmer or the like, and I just don't want to be off route when I get to that island in the lower part. Having said that, the vast majority of left side runs do work out fine. Of the possible mistakes at Crystal, the two that stand out are trying a downstream ferry from too far out in the center for a right side run and being too late or offline and committing to a left or right run of the island section down below. 
It's been a couple of exciting days working our way through the Granite Gorge, and we can breathe a little easier now as we move downstream. More than any rapid on the river, rowing through bedrock is a study in angles, flow direction, and pace. Rowing it can require precision on all those fronts. We've drilled into all the principles already, so let's see how they play out here. I'm certainly going to scout this rapid, and the right side is the only option for that. Unless I spend a lot of time to make the hike up high as the photographer of this image did, I'll be scouting from river level. During my scout, I see that there are two outflows from the rapid one from a left channel and another from here on the near or right side. The left side is like the dark side of the moon. There's no way during the scout to see what is over there. I do know from guidebooks and from legend that the left side is nasty. There are lots of stories of rafts getting pinned over there on this corner, jammed up against that left wall in the narrow channel, swimmers, broken oars, etc. So the only reasonable option is to run the right side. I also see that the upstream nose of the center of the rock has a lot of pin potential, so I got to stay away from that as well. As I scan upstream, I see that the flow in the entrance is literally greater than a 90 degree angle to the route I need for my exit here. It's clear that I'm going to need to use some sort of downstream ferry move cutting in the corner through these shallows. I also see that there is a strong current differential between the current and the eddy and that I'll need to manage my angle and my rowing to offset that. This is the crux of the rapid. Now, as I look more closely in my scout at flow directions in various places in the rapid, I see that this water draining from the cobble bar is flowing in this direction and I can tell that this is really going to mess with the move I need to make. The good news here is that the current velocities even out in the main tongue are not high like in some other rapids so maybe I'll have time to manage this routing. Rather than start from the top with my routing let's focus first on getting through the crux. In my scout I envision the raft position and angle I'll need to move through these specific currents and it looks like this. Remember, I always want to set my ferry angles relative to the flow that I am on at the moment. So please ignore the larger context of the rock, flows elsewhere, and the general direction of the river channel for the moment. At this point, the flow is in this direction. So in order to downstream ferry across that specific piece of current, it requires this kind of stern first angle. I'll also want to make sure my raft has good momentum in this direction to get well right. Now, if I look more broadly, I see that my stern is pointed directly at the big center rock, one of the key hazards I'm actually trying to avoid. And even wilder than that, my stern is pointed at the left shoreline in the bigger context of the river channel. It is just a very odd and counterintuitive thing for me to put my raft on this sort of angle relative to that larger context. I just have to remind myself that once I'm on the water rowing, I need to focus on my landmarks and trust the routing and angles planning I will have made while I was scouting. So let's start our planning at the top. As is usually the case for a downstream ferry, it helps to start a little wide. And since current velocity is not real high in the entrance, I'll position out here for my start. I've picked one of the larger rocks along the edge of the cobble bar right about here as my first landmark. I build momentum through the entrance. And here's a really important point. I've actually established a very aggressive stern downstream angle as I enter to counteract the tendency of the slower and shallower water on the right to spin my bow downstream. As I work my cut, I am very careful to maintain this sharp downstream angle, as getting spun bow downstream could create problems. I'm focused now on my next landmark, which is the corner of the cobble bar right in the crux. Now this requires turning my head a lot to look almost directly behind my raft, so this is a place where a passenger can help me monitor my route and my angle. 
And by the way, I always like to involve passengers in scouting and route planning for rapids that require downstream ferries for this very reason. They can help me monitor my position and angle. So I stay on route with that mental image of my raft and especially its angle and the crux that I conjured up during my scout. And it turns out I'm pretty much home free here. All that's left to do is finish my move into the eddy well right of all the trouble. Bedrock does not require a lot of strength or hard rowing to make the move I just described. What it does take is trusting these very aggressive and counterintuitive downstream angles. Let's watch this rower work a downstream ferry through Bedrock. She makes a fine run here. As for me, I tend to use a more aggressive ferry angle as we covered in the diagramming. One more point worth emphasizing is that anytime we are rowing in shallow water along the edge of a cobble bar, as is the case in rapids like Bedrock, House Rock, or even the right side of Crystal, it is really important to manage the depth of the blade of the downstream oar. Most rowers have had the experience of the blade finding a shallow rock and popping the oar out of the oar lock at just the wrong moment. Now, Bedrock is famous for giving rowers fits in their efforts to get to the right of the main rock. And in fact, lots of rafts do end up on the left side despite really energetic rowing efforts. There are two different scenarios that typically play out to cause that, so let's take a minute to explore them. One common scenario comes up when a rower attempts a traditional back ferry move to the right but ends up left instead. It usually goes something like this. As the rower enters the rapid and begins the backward pull, they set an angle that appears to the rower to be a decent stern right angle. When I say it appears, I mean that as the rower looks downstream through the rapid, they see that the alignment of the raft seems to have the stern on a healthy angle well right of the center rock. The rower also sees the left shore in the background behind the center rock, adding to the impression of a good back ferry angle. The problem, however, is that the direction of the current on which the rower is working is on this line. The result is that the rower is rowing more or less directly upstream relative to the current. And since a typical rower can row at a pace of about four miles an hour, and the downstream current underneath them is maybe nine miles an hour at that point, the result is a direct downstream slip at a net pace of about five miles an hour aimed left of the rock. It ends up feeling like some sort of mysterious magnet is unavoidably pulling the raft to the left channel. The second scenario often plays out something like this. A rower enters the rapid with a more aggressive stern right angle, maybe in a sideways ferry or even a modest downstream ferry angle. Early in the going, the rower makes good progress moving to the right. As the raft enters the shallows at the edge of the cobble bar, maybe along in here, the stern finds itself dragging in the slower and shallower water while the bow is in the faster flow closer to the center. That current differential between stern and bow results in a spinning effect that tends to swing the bow downstream. Despite good rowing efforts to counteract the spin, rafts often tend to lose that ferry angle anyhow at that point. Then at about this point, the raft encounters this piece of current that is sheeting right to left off the cobble bar, and that sheet flow redirects the raft on a leftward path. This is also a moment that tends to feel to the rower like their ferry angle might still be okay given the visual orientation to the center rock and the left shoreline. But of course, the force and direction of the current underneath the raft has a very different idea. Again, it feels like that mysterious magnet has somehow taken over. I hope that untangling the dynamics of these two problem scenarios helps you better see just how important that very aggressive stern downstream angle is in making your run. I'll say again that a successful run here is much more about good scouting and planning, about angle, and about position than it is about rowing effort. Bedrock becomes more difficult at lower flows, a lot like house rock does, as the channel narrows out to the left. With higher flows, the cobble bar gets covered with water, and that provides more space to cut the corner. As for plan B contingencies, if you do find yourself headed for the left route, 
Make sure and ship your oars before a rock catches one and alert your passengers that trouble might be brewing. Let's head downstream. Upset Rapid earned its name in 1923 when Emery Kolb, rowing in support of an early USGS mapping expedition, flipped in his wooden boat there. Here is a photo of Emery about two seconds before that incident. Upset has successfully earned its name and reputation many times over through the decades ever since. Let's work through the details of having a good run there. In our overhead view, we see that this rapid has most current running along that left side, with a slight bend to the right. During my scout from river level on the right, I look at the downstream end and see this fairly wide, very stiff breaking wave or hole taking up the middle 50% of the river channel. I can see that there is enough space to the right of the hole for a raft to pass cleanly. Because it's impossible to gain an elevated vantage point for scouting, it's really tough to tell how far that hole extends leftward and how stiff it might be over there. I know from experience though, and from watching videos of others, that there is a window or route to the left of that main hole. As I trace potential routes upstream, I see that the only entry is available on the left side. That means if I choose to go for the right side exit, it will require a pretty strong lateral move from left to right using a downstream ferry. Looking along the left side, it appears that if I start a bit out toward the center in the pool above, I can work a little right to left with forward pushing and get myself into a fairly clean route along the wall until I get down to the area left of that big hole at the bottom. So, there seem to be two different options. Based on my own efforts running right and left routes and what I've gathered from others, here's some insight about the two options. The downstream ferry approach for the left to right run makes for a big, big sustained pull. I was unable to find good video footage for this routing, so we'll just analyze it from the photo and the diagram. I know this from my own experience though, it requires maybe about 30 full strength pulls on the oars with no letting up to make that downstream ferry. It's just a long rapid. Any momentum I might have gained from the pool above would be quickly lost after the entrance. It's always a challenge to cut toward the inside of a bend like this. I can see there's a lot of sheet flow coming off that cobble bar. And I can also see that there is constant current differential I'd be battling the entire length of the rapid. The right run can be reliable for those willing and able to row with power for a long time. I suppose you could say the crux of that run is to be able to maintain that power and keep your raft moving. In choosing this option, the one thing to be ready for as a plan B is, as usual, tee up to that big hole if you're unable to make it all the way to the right. The first time I rode through this rapid in 1985, I was lucky that my raft penetrated and got through that wave when I found myself offline and facing down that big hole. As for the left side run, there's a decent route over there. It's just hard while you're scouting to see the window to the left of the hole. Let's follow this rower through. Note that she has started a bit out toward the center, is pushing right to left a bit, and passes just right of the big diagonal wave near the top. From here, the run is reminiscent of Granite Rapid, sort of along the wall, riding the high line, being careful to tee up to any diagonals from the wall we might encounter. Being on that route delivers your raft nicely through that window left of the hole at the bottom. The crux here is to be on the proper route just to the right of that big diagonal near the top and pushing left as you pass it. The good news with that is that you can see the diagonal from up in the pool as you approach the entrance, so the diagonal itself is your landmark. Mistakes on a left side run would include running left of that top diagonal, which could tangle you up with the wall itself, or perhaps trying to run through the diagonal, which could surf and redirect you back out toward the center and toward the big hole. 
Also, there's some big action in that window to the left of the hole, so make sure you are squared up and tee up to those waves as you go through. Onward. I'm not sure what the best introduction for Lava Falls is. It's the burliest of the burly, after all. So I'll try geology. Here is a Google Earth image of the area around lava. I saw this as I was zooming in for the aerial image we'll use in this, and I was just reminded how wild it can be to have spent days on a trip studying the more or less orderly sequence of colorful layers that make up the geology of the canyon, only to stumble into this relatively scorched landscape of remnant cinder cones and ancient lava flows. I guess that landscape is fitting for a rapid with the kind of reputation lava has earned. Before we get into the analysis, I'll just say that yes, there are occasional flips at Lava Falls, but with the honing of our scouting and rowing skills so far on the trip, a good run at Lava is within our grasp. It just requires some patience and trust in our planning and our scouting skills. Here we go. In this aerial view, I see that everything converges here for a center exit just left of this big diagonal chunk of igneous rock aptly named the Cheese Grater. At higher flows, a diagonal breaking wave forms off the left edge of the Cheese Grater, and it's important to be ready to square up to that. Just upstream in the center of the main flow is a really, really tall wave we call Big Kahuna. It's there at most levels and has flimp potential at some flows for those who find themselves off angle. Looking further upstream, the wide ledge hole really stands out as a harsh feature to avoid, and it is really bad at all flows. At flows up to about 18,000, I'll see that my only option for entry is on the right side. Higher than that, and the rockier left side becomes covered and begins to provide a possible route. Since the right side run is the most likely scenario, let's look at that first with some video of the action. Now, I want to scout from the right side, which gives us a nice elevated vantage point. Before charting a route, let's identify some of the key features. Of course, here's the infamous ledge hole. The diagonal that forms off the right corner of that ledge hole here is what we call the keyhole wave. It is prominent at flows below about 14,000. A little further downstream is the V wave, formed by two diagonals that come together. The V wave is more significant at levels higher than maybe 14,000. Note the eddy further right, and of course there's the cheese grater that is directly downstream of the V wave. Let's now move upstream above the entrance. We have this big prominent lava boulder extending from the shore, and trailing from the corner of it downstream is the famous set of swirls in the water surface called the burble line. As my eyes follow the burble line downstream, it diminishes right about here, and the thing to see is that there's a little left to right sheet flow that is kicking in at that point. Now for the route finding. Let's start with the crux. As we move through the area of the keyhole and the V-wave, we'll want to be on a right to left course so that we can end up left of the cheese grater. We'll want to meet these diagonal waves of the keyhole and the V-wave teed up at a perpendicular angle, and it's important to be on target here. If I am too far left, I find myself flirting with the ledge hole. If I'm too far right, I'm at risk of falling broadside into the right-hand diagonal of the V-wave, 
which can lead to a flip. If I'm way right, that eddy against the shore can grab or spin me and create problems. So the challenge here is nailing the route, but the problem is that there's really no obvious landmarks to key on in your downstream view. This is where the burble line comes into play. It is really our primary landmark until we are committed to the crux. And the key is to be directly on top of the burble line right here and where it swirls diminish if the angle of my raft is 45 degrees to the left, and if I have begun a vigorous push forward on my oars to the left, it will set me up just right to meet the keyhole and the left side diagonal of the V wave head on. Remember that there is left to right sheet flow happening here, just a little below the burble line, so that push to the left needs to be vigorous. Now, there's a period of about three seconds between the time you leave the burble line until you'll be able to see downstream into the keyhole and the V wave. In that case, the three seconds might feel like an eternity to you, so patience will be called for. This is the moment where you'll need to be putting strong trust in your scouting and in your planning. I'll highlight that as you leave the burble line, the sound and mist coming from the ledge hole and the other action can be intimidating, making it challenging to find that needed patience. It's not a good moment for indecision or for changing plans. By the way, I need to point out that many rowers do not make as much of a right to left move as I prefer to between the burble line and the V-wave. They tend to go more straight downstream and split the V-wave. In my mind, there are more unpredictable things that can happen when the pit of the V-wave is brought into play, so I favor the right to left approach and the predictability of hitting the left side diagonals head on. Now, let's plot out strategy to get onto the burble line. As I leave the eddy from up in the pool, the big boulder that forms the burble line is very obvious. I approach by aligning toward its corner, and I simply drift because downstream momentum is not my friend yet. I pass just off the corner of the boulder and get myself right on top of the burble line as expected. I love this piece of video. As you watch the rower, he is focused entirely on approaching that lava rock and making a little back ferry move to sit himself down exactly on the burble line with as little downstream momentum as possible. He's not worried or distracted by the view downstream. For him, it's all about the landmarks and going step by step with precision. Now, my bow is already set with its leftward angle as I'm on the burble line, and I push gently to make sure I'm staying exactly on top of it. And as I look down and see the burble line diminish, that's when I start my aggressive leftward push. I hope you see that physically executing the moves we have talked through here are not nearly as challenging as some of the moves we've made in rapids further upstream. Again, it's the patience, trust, and precision that are the real challenge. Good scouting and planning are the keys. Getting through this crux successfully is very doable, folks. Okay, we've made it past the V-wave, but we are not through the rapid yet. As we exit the crux, we are moving right to left on route for the big kahuna, and at higher levels, the diagonal that forms off the corner of the cheese grater. The water is big here, and we might have been knocked off angle a little bit. The idea, of course, will be to be in control and meet these big waves head on. It might be that this is the most important place in the Grand Canyon to have made sure that you have gotten really, really good at reacting quickly with powerful spin moves. At Big Kahuna, we want to be teed up with our oars planted to help us through the big, tall breaking wave. Once past the cheese grater, we are pretty much home free, but it will be important at that moment again to keep an eye on the other rafts in the group and be in position for rescue. Whew. Now, the flips that do occur here on the right side are often associated with some common mistakes, so let's talk about what those are. Probably the most common mistake comes as a rower is left of the burble line and becomes concerned that he or she is too much at risk of heading for the ledge hole and pulls on the oars to adjust rightward. The left to right sheet flow can add to that, and the result is usually ending up going broadside into the right-hand diagonal of the V-wave. That actually happens fairly often, and flipping is a common result. Another mistake could actually be getting on the burble line successfully, but orienting the bow of the raft straight downstream, which allows the sheet flow to take the raft rightward, and that in turn allows the pit or the right diagonal of the V-wave to spin and perhaps flip the raft. 
Again, a consistent angle from the top of the burble line all the way through toward Big Kahuna keeps it all simple and boils the challenge down to timing, patience, and precision. Now, let's talk about that left side run after we watch a run through it. Again, you might consider this route at levels above about 18,000 CFS. If you think you might be interested in the left side run, the best scouting location is on the high bench on the left overlooking the rapid. Note that if you scout from here and decide not to run the left side, it's easy enough to row across the pool and to go scout the right side from the proper location over there. As we look, let's start with the key features. Of course, we have the ledge hole, which is much more in play on a left run compared to the right run. And at these higher levels, it's a bad news place to end up. Upstream of that is this stiff diagonal wave that extends from the left. And further upstream, and very subtle and easy to overlook, is some powerful sheet flow moving left to right into the entrance. Looking downstream, once past the ledge hole, we'll note that there are some big waves with the flow moving rightward toward Big Kahuna. I'll say that threading the needle between that sharp diagonal wave on the left and the ledge hole on the right is clearly the crux here. There can be appeal to this route as it seems navigable without encountering a nasty hole or a serious breaking wave, but it's tricky and it does require running a very good route. And here's how that might go. I'll position myself in the pool upstream. My landmarks are these two smaller diagonals extending from the left shore. I want to be just to the right of those. My focus shifts to the larger diagonal on the left. My goal is to be pushing right to left at this point and to nick the right corner of that diagonal, again, moving leftward as I do. That leftward push is very important in order to counteract the left to right sheet flow. Now I'm into the meat of it, centered on the tongue that is left of the ledge hole, making sure to square up and push through whatever breakers come my way. I'm in good shape now, but as with the right side run, I need to square up and plant my oars for the big kahuna, and don't forget to be ready for rescue. The common mistake on this run is to be too far right relative to the landmarks, to miss seeing and reacting to the sheet flow, and to end up going into the big ledge hole. That happens surprisingly often. A good friend of mine who is a longtime pro boatman in the canyon says he opts for the right side run at most all levels. The reason being that while he knows he personally can time and make that requisite move over there on the left, there are often newer developing rowers along on his trip and his team just views that the right side run is more reliable for varying skill and experience levels. They're just not willing to bring that ledge hole into play. There is absolutely no joy in the world quite like getting through lava upright. So it's time to party. The 209 mile rapid is the final one we'll analyze. It's not too difficult if you're ready for it, but it seems like I hear of as many raft flips here as any other rapid on the river. And there are a couple reasons for that. One is that having gotten past lava falls and with all the miles of riffle after riffle, folks tend to let their guards down a bit. The other reason is that 209 sneaks up on you like no other rapid in the Grand Canyon. At one moment, you're drifting calmly across an enormous, quiet pool, and in the next, you are staring down the big hole in 209. It's helpful to start with this zoomed out aerial view. As you see, here is that big wide pool, and notice that the outflow from the pool is here at the downstream right side corner. If I shift to the Google Street View from about this point in the pool, I see what might appear to be just another riffle leaving the pool. 
Now, we all tend to drift down the middle of large pools like this, and if I don't yet recognize that 209 is coming up, that's probably where I'll be. So let me just say for now that it is vital that you know you are approaching 209. The way to know that is to track your progress with a little map reading, and perhaps based on that and the copy of this aerial view that I'll include in my downloadable PDF for you, you'll know where you are. You'll find Granite Park on your left in that big pool. So let's zoom in and look at the details of the rapid. If we were to scout this rapid, and you might well want to do that from the left, given the challenge and potential consequences, we'd see that there is a fairly long and continuous runout below the meat of the rapid. Now, something to note here is that this runout tends to be along the right shoreline, and that shoreline is made up of jumbles of limestone boulders that tend to have lots of sharp, angular corners and very abrasive surfaces. The reason I am pointing this detail out is that it may be the very worst place in the canyon to swim. The Park Service has done a number of emergency evacuations of folks with lacerations and other injuries from getting raked along that shoreline and its shallows. I'll just suggest right here that it would be wise to alert participants in your trip that if they find themselves in the water here, to swim to the center and ride out the rapid until rescue in the deeper part of the channel. Okay, our eyes take us upstream now and we see the notorious hole. This one has strong flip potential at a broad range of flows, and it's clear that I'll need to be left of it. This is the crux of the rapid. Our challenge comes with the way the flow is making this sharp bend from right to left, and with the tendency of the dynamics to take us to the outside of the bend. We've generally used a downstream ferry to cut across this sort of situation, but so far we've usually had generous pools above these cuts to establish position and angle and to build momentum. Because of the way the rapid emanates in sideways fashion from the pool, the best I'll be able to do is make sure I am established as far right as possible as I begin my cut move. In this case, that will mean being along the right shoreline and it will help if I start my move before I actually see much of the rapid. As I approach, I'm running stern first, almost within reach of that shore. The corner into the entrance is my first landmark, and when I emerge into the entry channel, I'm moving right to left across the direction of the current. Once I'm in that entrance, I'm able to see the hole and the crux pretty easily over my left shoulder, and at this point, it's all about managing my stern left angle and to keep pulling until I'm sure I'm well left and beyond the hole. Once past the hole, I'm pretty much home free. We've already touched on this, but the mistake here would be not recognizing that you're about to enter the 209 mile rapid. The typical situation, again, is that the unsuspecting rower is in the center of the pool, and in order to get into the rapid, has established a bunch of momentum from left to right. That has the rower and the raft moving with the sheet flow that is leaving the pool and entering the rapid. And that is actually opposite of what is needed because it takes the raft to the outside of the bend and toward the hole. As for scouting, depending on the experience level of rowers in your group, you might just want to do that. Making the move along the shoreline and across the entrance of the rapid requires a lot of faith in planning and managing the situation as it unfolds quickly in the entrance. At a minimum, it would be worth spending a bit of time before arriving here, perhaps at camp the evening prior, in a strategy session making sure everyone can recognize where they are and are ready to execute a good plan. Sort of scouting it on paper, I guess. Overall, missing that hole and avoiding the flip is not a very difficult move, assuming rowers all know what's up and can confidently use their downstream ferry. I mentioned earlier that rowing the big rapids in the canyon is not for beginners or novices, and I hope that our looks together at the rapids illustrate the kinds of challenges a rower can face. There's of course lots of carnage video online to get a deeper idea of what can go wrong out there. 
You might ask what level of experience and skill is necessary to row the canyon. The answers, of course, mostly relate to risk. I'm going to start by acknowledging that different people have different thresholds for how much risk to accept in any given endeavor. In the end, it should be up to each prospective rower to make an informed decision, and I emphasize the word informed here, about whether or not to take on the challenge. Whitewater, including very difficult whitewater like in the canyon, is nearly always very forgiving. Rafts that are off or out usually come through upright. When flips and swims do happen, they rarely end with injury or tragedy. But bad things happen all too often out there, and in nearly every case, they come as surprises. People involved in incidents like that nearly always wish they had been more careful or had developed better skills, or maybe they come to feel that they should not have gone on the outing at all. Here's my take about being ready. Rowing the Grand Canyon might be well within reach of a person who has, say, 15 days of rowing loaded rafts under their belt in Class 3 whitewater, that is, Class 3 based on a 1 to 6 ACA AWA scale. They should be confident moving a loaded raft around in those Class 3 rapids. Alternatively, people who have more extensive experience, let's say guiding paddle rafts or paddling canoes or kayaks in whitewater, perhaps class four whitewater, but maybe not having much experience rowing might well adapt quickly, assuming they get some rowing practice in early during their Grand Canyon trip. Having some skills and confidence in river rescue techniques is really important and so is being able to make independent judgments while scouting and reading quite water on the fly. And then there is fitness. Rowing the canyon does require some power and durability. These skills and required awareness are just too much for a novice to learn on the fly in the Grand Canyon if everyone is to be safe. Now, I know that from a trip leader standpoint, finding rowers like that to help you run your trip can be challenging. Let me offer these suggestions. If you are considering applying for a permit, carefully assess before applying whether you can populate your trip with the right number of ready rowers. Winning a permit, organizing a trip, and then being unable to gather enough skilled rowers is just a bad situation to find yourself in. In building your team, it's important to have a strong mix of experienced rowers as well. Most canyon trips are arranged months in advance, and that offers time for newer rowers to build skills and experience on other rivers. One idea for supporting newer rowers on a trip is to make sure they have rafts that are lightly loaded. Another is to scout more rapids early in the trip, helping developing rowers interpret the big water and the moves required. Encourage newer rowers to run their own routes based on their own scouting and their own water reading, and discourage them from hoping to row successful routes by following others. More experienced rowers on the trip can take on the roles of being ongoing mentors to the developing rowers. And find forgiving places in smaller rapids and riffles early in the trip and encourage newer rowers to practice techniques and moves, especially the downstream ferry. Again, I do appreciate that people might have different takes on all this and perhaps even different thresholds for risk tolerance. I'll just conclude by suggesting that for trip organizers and leaders, there is an extra burden of responsibility here regarding what an acceptable risk level might be for you personally versus what it might be for less experienced participants. Those newer rowers and passengers come along on the trip with less information and thus they are highly dependent on your judgment and your leadership. Let's be careful out there and thanks for keeping it safe. Well, we've gotten through the rapids, so let's wrap this show up. I hope you've gotten a few good tips out of this, and I hope you've enjoyed watching. You know, putting on a Grand Canyon trip is very much a group effort. Making this video has been a lot like that. Many thanks to all the people who have provided photographs, video clips, technical advice, and especially advice on how to run the rapids in the river. I've made a lot of new friends and rekindled relationships with a lot of old friends in the process. They are all noted in the credits. At the end of the credits, you'll find a link to download this entire video, as well as a link for downloading the PDF file with all the diagrams. You'll be able to take these and study them 
and maybe they can support you in your next Grand Canyon trip. Again, thanks so much for watching.